recent years, humanitarian responses have been complicated by compounding crises, such as climate change, epidemics, and pandemics, and complex conflicts. In an ever-changing humanitarian space, we ask, what does the safety and security of aid workers look like? And what might it look like in the future? I'm Tara Arthur from the Global Interagency Security Forum. In each episode, I'll be speaking to guests about topics such as the localization of aid, the ups and downs of community acceptance, and the role of digital security in the modern era. Join me as we unpack the changing face of humanitarian security risk management. Hi, James. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. If you would, please share, you know, a little bit about who you are, where you're coming from, and a little bit uh, about the organization that you're working with. Uh, okay. Well, so I'm James Davis. I'm from Canada. I'm currently based in the UK. Um, I've been working in sort of the international security sector for a little over 30 years total, starting in the Canadian military, UN peacekeeping roles. Um, worked a bit in the private sector um, around Africa, but uh, been in the current role that I'm in with the ACT Alliance as the global security advisor for nine years now. Um, yeah, so a <laughs> little bit of seniority in my job, I guess, and uh, it suits me, so I've been enjoying it, mainly because the ACT Alliance, for those that know nothing about it, which is a large portion of humanity, um, it's a global alliance, about 140 organizations, working in about 150 countries, uh, court, all sorts of programming, they do everything, you know, the three pillars, advocacy, humanitarian development. Um, quite influential. We sit on uh, quite a few major UN committees. We have an advisory seat on the UN Security Council. Um, yeah, so we do quite well. And my job is to provide sort of an information resource and training and advice and kind of a go-to place for knowledge on security risk management uh, for, I think we have about 30 international members and the lion's share, about 110 are all smaller national and local organizations. So we have everything across the board. And the big value we have is when a crisis happens somewhere in the world, there's a tornado, there's an earthquake, there's a, a you know, flood, whatever it is, or a war breaks out, very likely we already have members on the ground. So we don't have to deploy like some of the big international organizations. We're already there. Uh, we already have partners on the ground, act members on the ground. And so it makes my job rather dynamic that things can happen very quickly for me, even sometimes quicker than some of the big organizations that have to ramp up a response to a crisis where, you know, within 24 hours, we're already out and doing needs assessments. So. So, yeah, it's been a challenging job, and I enjoy it. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, as you talk a little bit about your background, given that we're, we're talking a lot about digital security today, can you share a little bit how you got involved with that, and where does that <laughs> come from? Where does that come from after that really interesting background you share? Well, since no one can see me, I'm a white middle-aged male, ex-military type, and I am not a technical geek. I'm not a kid who grew up in his parents' basement, you know, playing with code and, and gaming and the rest of it. So I'm not a natural fit for digital security. But one of the kind of the advantages I enjoy in my job, because I don't work for any one organization, I kind of have the, the time and the space and the mandate to sort of sit back and look at what's going on in the sector and mm. sort of piece together drivers that other people may not have sort of had a chance in the day-to-day -day grind to sort of see. And I tend to look at the big picture and, and try to think quite regularly what's around the corner or what's happening now that we're not really seeing, uh, you know, the forest for the trees. And sometimes it allows me to sort of get ahead of the curve. And we did it around gender uh, security work. We started doing that well before a lot of other organizations. We started looking into it. And then the digital security thing came along at the same time. I kind of climbed on the back of uh, a couple of other Acolytes members, especially uh, the work of a guy named Pierre Borno with uh, LWF and uh, Sickle Pipker with ICCO that set up our initial uh, cybersecurity guidelines document. And then I took that and turned it into a training package. And we've been delivering cyber, cybersecurity training, digital security training, and uh, briefings and whatnot for about a year and a half now. That's really interesting. 
you know, if we can just take a step back and, and introduce us to the topic a bit about what is digital security? What is that? <laughs> uh, it's kind of a funny one because uh, we are so enmeshed in, in electronics these days. It's so much a part of our world. It's like the air we breathe. We don't see it anymore. Yeah. And we are literally, we always like to say, especially as the Europeans or North Americans that, you know, the, the people we work with in the communities in the global south, if you want to use that term, often suffer from the boiling frog syndrome. The boiling frog, for those who don't know, it's just an old proverb that basically says if you uh, take a frog, a live frog, and throw him into a pot of boiling water, he's going to jump out. But if you put a live frog in a pot of cool water and he starts swimming happily around and then slowly start turning up the temperature, he's going to be saying, ah, it's getting hot in here, but I'll be fine. And it gets a little hotter. Oh, whew. Pretty hot in here, but ah, it'll get better soon. And the frog will swim around until it boils to death. And that's the boiling frog. We don't see the change in the environment around us. We are literally, in our culture, that has a larger predominance of electronics, seeing the digital uh, boiling frog. We don't see how engaged we are <laughs> with digital devices. It's not just devices. It's software. Every bit of software you use in a computer, this Zoom software that we're using to talk on right now, is run and developed by a software company that wants to make money. And in the modern world, data is more valuable than diamonds. Uh, data is for sale. And if you look probably into the fine print of all the software your organization is using, there's fine print saying that they can share some of that data with relevant parties for advertising purposes. And so everything we do, our social media, how we travel, how we book flights, how we transmit data, this Zoom call, everything we do has a digital footprint. It's in our home. It's in our vehicles when we drive, it's in our office, it's everywhere we are. And there are massive vulnerabilities with that. And unfortunately, in the modern world, aid organizations and NGOs are not perceived as the good guys by everybody. And, you know, people see some pretty big numbers bandied around by major donors. And, you know, criminal organizations say, well, I'd like a little piece of that $50 million funding project that somebody's just won or a state that isn't quite agreeing with some of the human rights uh, agendas your organization has in advocacy wants to know what you're going to be talking about when you meet with people in their communities. And so we have massive vulnerabilities. So digital security is basically anything that is touched by electronics and sort of the modern digital footprint that we all have organizationally and individually. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot to take in, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I guess that goes to you, you started to really talk about this of why this is important to the humanitarian sector why we need to take more attention and, and really get more engaged in this issue well it's it's one of those interesting things about being a security risk management professional I mean like probably a few I come from a military background there's nothing in my professional training that, that makes me a digital security expert. Um, but in a lot of what we do in our job, we're having to, to stretch our boundaries. So people who used to be in charge of the locks on doors and the alarm systems and telling staff how to safely get in a car and drive somewhere. Now we're talking about legal liability, crisis management, counterterrorism legislation, uh, issues around sexual violence and reporting, investigation, and, and the breadth and scope of what we need to become experts on. Because when our senior management team has a question, who do they turn to? And so I think recently, just because we're so overwhelmed as security risk management professionals and the scope of what we need to have at least some understanding of is so broad that digital security has just been one of those things that we thought IT departments handle that. We don't need to worry about that. But uh, it's a rare IT department that can look at the social media reputation risk issues to an organization because some staff member in some community somewhere in the world makes a post on Facebook about something they're doing in a program that then puts people at risk, either staff or community members. And so there's a massive gap there about all this massive digital security risk, who's responsible for it. And when a senior management team wants an answer, where are they going to turn? Not the IT people. They're going to turn to the security risk management staff. And so I think all of us uh, that work with large organizations and have anything to do with risk need to really start looking at not so much the technical detail around digital risk, but what are the implications of this, you know, massive digital footprint we have? Yeah. And I guess, you know, building off of that a bit, uh, you, you started to talk a little bit about um, examples uh, that you have run, run into. 
Um, but what are some other things that organizations really need to be thinking about wh when it comes to the risk around digital security? <laughs> well, kind of, you know, we, we have the, uh, the SDGs and we have the um, localization agenda going on in the sector right now. And, you know, one of the consequences of that is we're trying to minimize the international footprint. The funding still comes from largely international donors. In fact, the vast majority of all funds only come from really three international sources. And those donors have requirements around, you know, sort of evaluating and impact assessments. But because we don't have the actual human footprint on the ground, we're turning increasingly, like a lot of the world and a lot of sectors, to digitalizing our processes data capture, data management, tracking. And, you know, there's a recent case in Eastern DRC that has come out where some UN agencies and some very well-known and well-respected NGOs got caught out in fraud. Now, while the fraud was done by people, uh, the system that they manipulated was basically, no one was going out and verifying uh, beneficiaries of a program. And that allowed them to create ghost beneficiaries, enter them into the data system, and suddenly certain people were getting benefits that were intended for someone else that doesn't actually exist. And that's because we don't do aid work the way we used to. And that's kind of symbolic about how we work across many sectors. Now, if we want to do an impact assessment, we feed it all into a software program, that then spits out the results on the other side so we can tabulate, make nice pie charts, get, you know, percentages of people impacted and households, you know, affected. And, and all of that has a digital risk to it. And where does the data that you put into that software that you think you own actually also go, uh, both legally because of the fine print, but also illegally, because people also want to know that information. They want to know who's getting cash deposited in their bank accounts through a cash-based program or getting access to, to some kind of stuff, or in a culturally conservative environment, you know, which young ladies are finding out about sexual health and reproductive rights when their parents and other people in the community don't want that message being passed along. So, so yeah, it's, it's just kind of symbolic of the way we along with the rest of humanity at the moment is moving you know into this sort of digital way of working yeah that's those are some great points for sure um you know i i want to take it back a, a little bit on your point about it professionals and security managers and kind of that balance of you know needing to kind of understand both hat to a, a certain degree you know let's unpack that a little bit <laughs> um, yeah, and it's because, I mean, obviously when I started looking at this, I realized I'm not a digital security expert, and I started looking around for people who were digital security experts, but were also were, with, were within my price range if I wanted to hire a consultant. And to be honest, it just doesn't exist. You know, we have IT people who are pretty good with software. They can run your, your server for your organization. They can debug, you know, laptops and whatnot. To have people who really understand digital risk, as soon as you become in any way proficient of that, you are so valuable in the modern world, you're charging six figures, you know, if you want to uh, contract yourself out to someone. And, and that's just beyond the scope of international NGOs, let alone sort of smaller national organizations where actually a lot of this risk exists. And so you could take an IT person from an NGO and send them off to get up skilled. But as soon as they pass out of a course, some big corporation or even a government department is going to snatch them up and say, Hey, we need that person. They've got experience that we need. And so we're left in this gap where our uh, vulnerability is increasing, but we don't have the capacity to manage it very well. And I don't know anyone really interested in IT that wants to work for the money that aid workers work for while also being, you know, an expert in digital security. So, uh, yeah, it puts us kind of in a bit of a catch-22 situation there. Well, taking that, and then um, let's talk about compounding crises, and let's talk about how that might fit into some of the issues that we're facing today, given that we're in the midst of a pandemic, and uh, obviously many of us are really transported a lot of our work and efforts online. So... Uh, yeah, take us there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's a perfect example of something none of us were really ready for. I mean, nobody anticipated COVID. Uh, we all, those of us that worked in uh, Ebola, we all got through that. And there were some complex issues around that. But the scale and scope of this has just been beyond the pale. And so, yeah, this digital way of working, working from home, social isolation, all the rest of it forced us even further down that digital pathway. Our digital footprint has increased. And, uh, 
a lot of people had never heard of Zoom before, you know, COVID crisis, and now a good portion of the world is using Zoom, and Zoom wasn't prepared for this either, and their security systems, as we're all well aware, you know, weren't up to the, the, the job, and Skype, and Zoom, and Adobe Connect, and all these others, um, all kind of face the same challenges, and then uh, I had an interesting request the other day from our Brussels office, which does a lot of work with the European Commission, and uh, they have so many meetings now that they can't keep notes. Taking notes just takes too much time. And they were looking for a digital uh, voice recognition software that could actually just do e-transcripts of all of their online meetings and then just publish that. And they recognize that the translations might not be exact, um, but as, if it captured the general host of the, or just of the meeting, then that was fine but they want to know what the risks were. And if you look into the uh, there's various online platforms that do that kind of thing, um, if you look into the fine print of the software agreement, it says right there that some of your data will be shared with third parties for advertising purposes only. So mm. though probably your, your identity as an account holder uh, would be kept secure and the actual conversations are end to end encrypted like many social media and chat apps the actual data that you transmit could have chunks of it taken out and then assessed by commercial organizations who want data to then target back what kind of services you might be willing to buy. So here's a vulnerability right there. And if they can get access to that data, who else can get access to that data? There's a lot of go governments who'd like to know what our advocacy policies are going to be on certain subjects that are a little bit culturally sensitive. So um, it's just another example that we've had to move more into that digital uh, arena but not many people really thought of some of the consequences. And I'm a big fan of trying to overcome the law of unintended consequences. And we've seen all sorts of unintended consequences out of social distancing rules and social isolation and the stress it causes, caused by the way we respond to COVID-19. And on the digital side, we're going to see even more of it. Um, you know, there was something like $45 billion in cybercrime uh, in 2019. And I'm sure when we get the numbers for 2020, it's going to be significantly higher than that globally. Yeah, that's pretty substantial to think about. And then, yeah, given that we've shifted so much online, what the the rolling impact will be, you know, as other other situations unfold and and we stay in this kind of online um, world, I also understand that you've helped develop some resources and tools that that others might find useful as they navigate these complexities? Well, I'd love to take full credit, but as I say, I bore heavily from the work of my predecessors who actually know what they're talking about. But because I wrote the original first draft of the GISF security to go uh, tool, um, and now I guess it has an electronic version as well, um, I was asked to create a digital uh, security module for it because I've been working and training on digital security for a while now. And so using that basic format, I took the documentation we already had and the knowledge I built up from that and all the feedback I got from training around the world doing the digital, digital security training. Cause actually I, I discovered some really interesting things while I was out there and heard some interesting stories. Uh, and then I could actually feed all of that into sort of a very brief, here's hitting the highlights of what everyone needs to know around digital security, not to make you any kind of a technical, digital security geek uh, or in any way an expert, but at least if you are a security risk manager and you have no idea about digital security or you're starting a new program or there's a new crisis somewhere and you're sending staff out, what are the major high points I need to think about before I, I want to send people out there and how is the digital footprint that they're going to have impact themselves, the communities, the program, and the organization? Can you share some examples of those those stories you encountered? <laughs> well, one of the best ones just recently was uh, actually one of the guys who wrote the digital security guide was in Ethiopia doing a training. And during the training, a sort of mini coup occurred in Ethiopia and a general announced he was going to take over a certain section of Ethiopia. Uh, another general was murdered and the whole country went into immediate lockdown. All the, the email systems were shut down, phone networks were shut down. And they talked about it, uh, he and the students, and they decided to keep keep the training going. And while they were training, occasionally the phones would sort of come on, they'd be on for an hour or so, and then the government would shut them off again. And they happened to be going through the kidnapping module, you know, in a classroom environment, they weren't acting anything out. And as they were talking about kidnapping and an attack, suddenly the phone rang of one of the Ethiopian people in the room. 
And a voice asked if everything was okay. They'd heard the words kidnapping and attack. And suddenly everyone in the room went quiet and thought, okay, who's listening and how did they know that? And the, you know, the participant in the training said, no, we're doing a training here. Everything is okay. All right. Well, if anything happens, just call this uh, number back and let us know. Click. And of course, for the rest of the training, it was just looking around and going, huh? So there's actually organizations, and we heard a really good sort of uh, first-person account uh, at one of the GISF forums where an organization doing something controversial in a country that was fairly sensitive banned smartphones and laptops from any meetings discussing that program. They couldn't even be in the room with them because you can be listened to. Your phone listens to you all the time. If you have Siri or one of these things and you say, Siri, find me an Indian restaurant, Siri is listening to you. And Siri listens for more than the words Indian restaurant. So that if you read the fine print in your user agreement with any of these phone companies, it's there. So yeah, there's just all sorts of fun little stories like that. We had a, a senior director of communications uh, had her computer hacked, all of her personal files and work files stolen and ransomed back for 157,000 euros um, because she was very visible, didn't have very good passwords on her systems and someone sent her a fake email. She opened it, it dropped in a virus, they got control of her account and locked her out of her own account. So this kind of thing's happening all the time and the amount of losses um, are significant. And the threat to staff and programs and acceptance is the big one is significant. Yeah, can you dig a little bit deeper into that one? Um, well, we always tend to forget as humanitarians and, and aid workers that acceptance isn't something we automatically get. You have to earn it. And very often in the places where it's most difficult to earn acceptance of the local community are also the ones that are sort of on tender hooks. And as we've learned uh, to our chagrin in the past few years, social media and you know, sort of chat apps and whatnot can be manipulated by people with agendas. And sometimes those agendas don't like the messaging we're bringing into communities. Very often because our money comes from European donors, they have sort of clauses if you want to accept um, you know, support from a European donor, you have to accept gender equality, you have to accept um, sort of all sorts of things about local culture. So where fraud and corruption is just a part of life, well, you can't have that if you're going to take, you know, funds or something out of this program. And so very often you will see people with an agenda that don't like that particular international organization, maybe a Christian organization in a Muslim country, maybe a secular organization that is you know, very open with sexual health and reproductive rights, and they will start spreading rumors. And unfortunately in the modern world, when a rumor comes out, you are guilty until proven innocent. And that's the way the digital world works. And so gaining acceptance and keeping acceptance is a really fine balancing act. And it, crisis comms around social media kind of stories are critical because if you respond to these things, sometimes it gives them legs and it spirals out of control. If you ignore them, sometimes they disappear because the Kardashians released a new perfume line and nobody remembers anymore, but you just never know. And so it's always a fine balancing act and that acceptance is key, getting it, maintaining it. And in West Africa, not long ago, CRS had a massive data breach and lost the personal details of something like 8,000 families there goes your acceptance in that community. Who's got that information? What are they doing with that information? We don't know. And so, you know, the, the digital impact on your acceptance is huge. Yeah, that's really important for us to, to keep in mind indeed. You know, just thinking about the, the impact in local organizations and, um, you know, what, what some of that looks like. Do you have specific tips or and or threats that you think might be um, really important for local organizations in particular? Um, one of the biggest challenges, if you work with a lot of local partners and national organizations that don't have the resources of the big European or North American organizations is they can't afford the software licenses. So very often, if you have someone working from their phone or laptop, a lot of the software on their laptop is probably pirated. And where we in North America through our IT departments are always, if there's a security update released by you know, Microsoft or whoever, we update immediately because we re recognize the vulnerability. If you have a pirated version of the software, you don't get those updates. And so you're working with one that has massive vulnerabilities. And when their local software, whether it's a Skype or whatever it is, links up with your uh, 
software in Europe, whatever is in their computer is very likely filtering through into yours because you, you've opened up an end-to-end -end link. Technically, it's encrypted, but it's also an end-to-end -end link. So um, and with local partners, very often, because they are in that environment, they don't see the shifts and changes. To them, it's just normal politics. And very often, they can get caught out where we sitting back, as we always like to do, saying, have you noticed this? Or, you know, have you noticed that? Did someone put this story out there? Did that staff member actually post that they were going to visit this project with all these children next week on Tuesday? Um, and so a lot of it's training. And of course, when security people do training, we don't talk about digital risk. You know, we're one of the few organizations that I'm aware of that incorporates digital security into our mainstream security training. And staff really don't understand sometimes what their vulnerability is. A lot of people's password is password. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not complicated. And so when their system is hacked, your system is hacked. You know, you're in a training and they hand you a flash drive because they want to download the presentation you just gave. You take it, stick it in your laptop, load up the presentation while downloading all the viruses that they've got in their hacked computer system. Yeah, so um, I guess some of the strategies to supporting that improvement, as you said, is training. Would you say the module gives some good resources as organizations consider bringing in more of a digital footprint into their training? Yeah, well, the the uh, the digital security to go uh, or security to go digital uh, module is pretty simple, and even the training that I deliver is pretty simple. If you even when I was writing it, uh, it was sent off to some experts to feed back, and they started getting into some really technical stuff that if I had actually put in there, nobody would read. Your eyes kind of gloss over. So my theory, and because I'm not a digital security geek, I keep everything really, really simple. You know, the first thing I always do in a digital security training is scare the crap out of everybody by giving them very clear examples of how it can go horribly wrong and how it affects you personally, mm. your bank card, how your bank account can get hacked, how you suddenly get a bill in the mail for 25000 for a visa card you never applied for, you know, how it can affect businesses, uh, how it can, can destroy lives if, you know, you're blackmailed online. And once I've scared the crap out of them, then I start giving them, okay, here's how criminals or organizations or governments do it. Here's some simple ways that they break into your system or hack your, your bank details or whatever it is. And then we talk about very simple ways you can prevent that. And actually, it's not that complicated. There are simple things that every one of us can do to make our digital sort of exposure significantly less. And uh, if I can you know, pass along simple things that people retain, and I try to make it a little bit of fun. I show a video of some of the things people do walking around with phones in their hands. Uh, that gets a good laugh and people tend to remember that. So anyway, I just try to make it simple and, and demystify it and don't make it a technical thing. And you find people actually, because we all have smartphones, we all have laptops, they, they can see a daily sort of need for this and very quickly it could become part of their, uh, their normal routines. Switching gears slightly, I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about some of the innovations that we might look out for, or are there any innovations that might help us along the um, along this digital journey we're on? Well, uh, interestingly, just as an aside, I'm a big fan of SpaceX, and so I follow everything SpaceX does. But the one thing that I'm very, very keen on is they're doing their Starlink network, which when it's done will be something like 20 or 40,000 satellites up there and will bring... Uh, high-speed broadband to the entire planet and so it doesn't matter if you are in the bush in Zambia or you're in Rome or you're you know Seattle you can access high-speed internet and you can imagine what's that going to do to the way we work when wherever that person is in a village on a project you could have a zoom meeting and have good high-speed broadband with them that is a game changer in so so many ways and we don't know what the pricing structure is going to be you know will it be affordable Elon Musk's stated goal is that he wants everyone in the world to have access to high-speed broadband. So I can see that there'll be sort of scaled sort of pricing systems for it. But once that's in place, if organizations sign up, and Starlink isn't the only one. There's other companies that are doing similar types of satellite constellations for internet. But the latency will be good enough that you can run a video conference with no, no lag at all. And this is what we're being told anyway. So that on the horizon is one, going to be one of the major changes. So when a donor wants to do or see a monitoring and evaluation trip, you don't need a massive team on the ground. You could actually do it digitally. You could line up 25 families and interview them on camera 
And the donor, if they wanted to, could even ask direct questions to the family about how they were impacted by the program delivery. And now there's abuses. You could obviously kind of work into that if you were you know, not on the up and up, but checks and balances, you know, can be worked into the system. So that's huge. The other interesting thing in a both good and bad way is AI. Um, Everybody thinks about AI like a science fiction movie, you know, robots taking over the world. But AI is increasingly playing a part in everything we do. Um, our cars are operated by AI systems now. Um, all the facilities and utilities we use, electricity, water, everything, they're all managed by AI systems. All the internet software, everything is all run through AI systems. And AI systems learn quite quickly. And... NGOs don't tend to be on the cutting edge because we can't afford sort of leading edge systems. But I mean, commercial organizations have been using AI software for pattern recognition, data analysis for years and years and years. And it gives them the ability to sort of target where they're going to get the most bang for the buck in terms of advertising dollars or selling whatever product they have. And NGOs, we tend to always both philosophically and in the real world lag behind on adopting new technologies. But well, there's certainly risks with uh, turning traditional functions of aid workers over to AI systems. There's also, if it's done properly, less chance for fraud and corruption and various abuse. And also, um, it just makes it a better system. And we're struggling now because the aid model is changing. With the localization agenda, a lot of the big NGOs, the global organizations with massive staff payrolls, are struggling to figure out how they're going to cover these big overheads when the money is going to start bypassing them and going straight to smaller organizations. And they are going to have to, to cut back, unfortunately, um, on staffing, but they can pick up capacity by using AI systems. Now, we don't see it as AI. We see it as some software package that we're getting sold to do data management or fill out forms or do surveys or whatever it is and then capture that data. You know, we all use things like SurveyMonkey, which takes information inputted by human beings and turns it out as some type of formula. And that's all software and there's an AI function in there. So, so those two things, between easy access to broadband and increasing use of AI, and we can't avoid it, so we might as well figure out how to adopt it, are uh, the two big changes I see on the horizon around the digital environment. Wow, that definitely gives us a little peek and in, into the future of what the aid sector might be um, embracing or uh, adapting to. So have a look at your CV and decide if you have a role <laughs> in the, the, the new aid world. The new aid world, yeah, and, and digital is definitely a, a huge um, factor for us to to make sure we're staying up on and probably so, in that emerging economies are the ones who are embracing uh the digital revolution often very much more than the traditional sort of european and north american economies well the private sector does emerging economies love uh all these tools and resources they can get access to and so we're very likely to be left behind again you know when we want to hire a staff member it's not looking at an international staff member with a traditional education and you know, social development. It's looking for an IT person from Africa or Asia who actually knows how to run all these systems that our organization can't function without anymore. That's a really important point about the skill sets needed to really engage in this sector going forward. Um, yeah, so in terms of that and, and thinking about some of the challenges you mentioned earlier with being able to find people who can really think about the digital aspect but also the security aspect you know some of those those cross skills um what are some of the other cross skills that you think we'll we'll need considering that as you mentioned um with the idea of maybe wider broadband access in the future and um, some of these ai systems do you feel that there's going to be some additional skill sets that are needed um, that sit just outside of the IT space, for example? Well, while I hate to say it, um, scooters managers, the way they've existed over the past 10 or 15 years are really, you know, I feel like a dinosaur in the room as an ex-soldier. If you look at GISF and we have a forum, broadly now, there's a few of us left in the room, but we are the dinosaurs. It's more younger people. They come up through a programming background. They somehow moved into the security track and they're really what the future of the scooters managed professionals are, but their time is limited as well. And very soon they're going to become the dinosaurs in the room because the way we work is changing. 
Uh, the model we've had for years is changing. And the people that organizations are going to be turning to, to manage 10 years from now is not the crusty old military guys anymore. Uh, it might not even be program people who are used to being out there in the field, you know, slobbing bags of uh, weed around or, you know, doing a door to door needs assessment. We won't be working like that anymore. And the skill sets we're going to need are going to change. And so I would suggest that people who are sort of in the security risk management sort of line, one, you've got job security. Out of all the sort of staff roles in an aid organization going forward, you're the one that's not going to be made redundant. But you're going to need to evolve. And the problem is I don't see any place any one of us can go right now to really get high quality education and experience on this. It's more that the best we can do at the moment is broaden our horizons, see the big picture, overcome the boiling frog and recognize we have a challenge and then figure out, as we've been doing for years, the best mitigation strategies we can recommend to our organizations to overcome these. But as we go down this path, this, you know, when you do a risk assessment for a new program, it's not going to be so much keeping the people on the ground safe. It's going to be how are we going to manage our digital exposure in running this out, both from a communications perspective, a sharing information perspective, a data collection, data analysis, financial management. These are all digital tools that will become the key in the future. And so I think from a security risk manager's perspective, we're all going to have to evolve. And I, I don't think I'll be around that long, but I'd be really curious to see who's sitting in a GISF forum in 10 years and sort of go around and ask what their skill sets are. And it would be, I think, a really entertaining exercise. You're going to have to check back in in about <laughs> time and see. <laughs> now, you know, um, I'm thinking about uh, the pandemic, COVID-19. What, you know, do you feel that you're gaining any of those mitigation strategies that you haven't been able to maybe wrap? around to date? Do you feel that this pandemic is providing maybe some opportunity to really advance that ev evolution process? Uh, I would like to say yes. I would have to say for myself, no. Most of the, like I can read all sorts of online papers and studies and listen to expert opinions, but virtually all of the knowledge I've gotten as a serious management over the years comes from being out in the field and doing trainings and talking to people. And unfortunately, sitting here in isolation, as we all are in whatever country and city we're in, we're not hearing the voices of the people who are on the ground who are having to react at the other end of this and try to keep things going, not only keep their families alive and safe, but keep their programs and their jobs secure, keep the communities they're working in supported. And those are the voices that I, <laughs> I need to hear. I need to hear what are the challenges they're facing, what problems have they run into, you know, are donors pulling back a little bit because they're not sure that they can get enough monitoring evaluation in? Is money being sourced locally, you know, through local fundraising drives? It's replacing the traditional aid model. Um, we saw a lot of that globally where communities came together around COVID to kind of support the vulnerable in their communities. And that's brilliant. I mean, that's the future of the aid sector, I think. But I can't be out there. And it's frustrating to me because I can't just send an email to someone and say, hey, What's your experience under COVID-19 and expect to get anything out of that? It has to be kind of an engaging conversation. So I think we've already talked about how we're going to start doing face-to-face -face training again um, and some of the things we're going to do. I mean, I ran training in West Africa around the Ebola time. We just had, you know, the, the, the housekeeping briefing at the beginning of the training was just a little bit longer and slightly more involved than it would normally be, but it didn't stop us from doing training. There was hand washing stations before you came into the building. There was decontamination while just, hand, you know, you did your hands, you had your temperature checked before you came in the training room. We had people sitting apart. There was no handshaking and that. We did fine. And, you know, compared COVID to Ebola, COVID is serious, obviously, because of the global uh, impact of it but you know on the scale of uh, virulence with ebola it just doesn't touch it so um there are ways to work and we're going to be training and i think a lot of the lessons i'm going to get out of all this will be when i sit down and, and talk to people on the other end of these zoom calls that don't have the bandwidth struggling to carry on they can't get the reports off whatever it is they can't engage with their donors uh, back here in europe or north america and, and see you know how did they manage what tools did they use to overcome where do they have problems and I'm actually looking forward to that quite a bit, not only because I get to get on a plane and fly somewhere again and I'm not stuck in rural England, but because that's where the action is. And for me to do my job, I need to hear those voices. Yeah, that's, yeah, we do. We, those voices are, are key to the whole 
humanitarian infrastructure, humanitarian development infrastructure. Indeed, those are the voices that that we're here for. So um, as you think about the local voices and what can be done now, do you have any other tips that you might consider sharing um, for organizations who are trying to hear a little bit more of that local voice? Um, we don't have Starlink yet, but <laughs> are there are there um, resources or other um, strategies that organizations might try or are you trying um, to hear more of that local voice? Well, it's kind of, you know, an extension of things we've been doing for years. You know, we talk about code of conduct and you have to train staff in code of conduct. We talk about sexual harassment and, you know, in the workplace and uh, safeguarding. Safeguarding would be a great example of how we push a message out to staff to change attitudes and awareness around, you know, biases they have and ways they've been doing things in life that may be culturally acceptable in the context they're in, but in the grand scheme of things, don't work if you're working in an international organization, which has a code of conduct. And so we, if we follow the same kind of methodology. We can roll out more awareness of what these digital security threats are. Very simple sort of suggestions, uh, how to keep yourself safe. Awareness of what a phishing email is. You know, these emails we all get, it look like they're from someone we work with, but it's actually a fake email. And they say, here's that file you requested. Just click on the link below and, uh, you know, you'll see the document you asked me for. And you're going, I don't remember asking for a document. I'll have a look and see what that document is. And now you downloaded a virus. So just all sorts of simple tips. And once you start down that path, it becomes much easier further down the road when you can get out and do security trainings again or however you do it in your organization to put digital security front and center in all the other security you do. And I just always like to tell people that you haven't done a risk assessment properly until you've assessed the digital risk in doing anything, taking a trip, running a program, going to the office, opening a new office, whatever it is. If you're not assessing the digital risk, you're not doing a risk assessment properly. So, Those are some definitely interesting strategies for us to, to keep in mind. You know, just thinking about all you've shared and, and a lot of the interesting points you've made, what are some of the, the takeaways you would have? <laughs> well, that's actually for whoever listening to this, I suppose. But if I had to sort of steer you in any particular direction, it's find a way to step back, look at the big picture, and just see if you, like many people, are suffering from the boiling frog syndrome. Um, you know, accept that you do have a lot of risk. Accept that sometimes it's insidious. You don't really see that risk occurring around you. And it's like, it's almost like... Uh, uh, that movie with Keanu Reeves, uh, The Matrix, where, you know, there's a whole world going on and most people never see it. And suddenly you take the wrong pill and you realize that, you know, there's a whole digital world happening in the background that no one else is aware of. And suddenly you see and you can you can manipulate if you wanted to, but hopefully you can protect those people who don't see it yet and get them to take the right colored pill so that they now understand what's going on in The Matrix. Oh, The Matrix. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, James, for joining us. This has been really, really interesting and insightful for us to dig a little bit more into this digital security considerations. My pleasure.